Welcome to the Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Vantage Circle, the simple and AI-powered rewards and recognition platform for employee engagement. Hi everyone, I'm Shushmita from the Vantage HR Influencers Podcast and in this episode, we'll talk about a fearless culture, the science of a fear-based work culture, its effects, together with some brilliant examples of organizations who are doing it the right way. For the same, I have with me guest speaker, Gustavo Rajeti, who is the CEO of Fearless Culture, a culture design services consultancy that helps organizations build purpose-driven, innovative, and agile cultures. Welcome to the show, Gustavo. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Same here. Okay, so before we uh, start with the topic today, it would be great if you can uh, let us know about your journey in the corporate world. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, I've been working as a consultant for like uh, three decades now, and most of my career has been in the idea space. So basically helping uh, organizations become more innovative Mm. in the marketing and, and, of course, innovation space. And one of the things I realized throughout my path is that most companies don't lack ideas or talent or resources. Actually, the biggest uh, hurdle is their culture, no? So basically, is their culture conducive towards innovation and promotes new creativity and new ideas, or does it not? Mm. So in the past few years, I've been exploring and focusing more into helping organizations developing a more human, purpose-driven, innovative kind of culture. Right. So uh, tell us about the inception of a fearless culture, as well as how you uh, know you support teams and companies in developing purpose-driven and agile and innovative culture. So I think as you have told that uh, you have uh, you know worked for uh, you want to you have researched on the culture of different teams and everything. So a fearless culture is definitely one part of it, right? So you have continuously been researching on that, if I'm not wrong, right? Uh, yes. Yes, you're right. Yeah, so basically, I mean, one of the things, uh, as I mentioned, we try to uncover what are the key elements of culture. And in most of the cases, people think in culture, company culture, like, okay, having a purpose, meaning a a set of core values, and that's it. Mm. And through our research and working with different organizations, we uncover what's now the culture design canvas, which is a more comprehensive framework to map assess and design the culture of different uh, companies and it includes not just the core which i mentioned before you know, the purpose core values the behaviors that we reward and punish but also the emotional side of culture you no know, psychological safety feedback and and team rituals and on the other side uh, what's the functional culture and you know? also how do we meet how do we work together how do we collaborate how do we make mm-hmm. decisions and also the norms and rules that define expected behaviors. Right. So why do you think uh, a fearless culture, workplace culture is so important, especially in these times of, of a crisis, probably? Uh, that's a good question. I think that uh, like everything you mentioned, the crisis, you know, like the pandemic magnified everything. No? Hmm. So it's not that basically create a new uh, thing, but basically amplified both the good and the bad within organizations. Exactly, exactly. Uh, One of the biggest challenges that we face, both as individuals, but also as part of a team or a larger company, is fear, no? So fear is a pervasive emotion. It's not that it's bad, because, I mean, if we wouldn't be afraid, we would basically get ourselves into trouble. So fear is a basic emotion that's kind of a signal that tells us that something might go wrong. Now, the problem is when fear becomes a barrier for people to speak up, to be honest, to bring their full selves to work, to uh, speak up their mind, share their ideas in the open. So when we talk about fearless cultures, we're not talking about removing fear, but basically it's about living from a place of courage, despite our fear. So we're able to understand what's going on. We're able to confront our fears and we are able to lead from that place. Right. Yeah. So uh, we see that, uh, Gustavo, it's a typical issue in many businesses that everyone knows that something is wrong, but they expect someone else to fix it. Right. So what do you have to say about that? Like, first of all, let's talk about the science first, that what are the signs of a fear-based work culture, maybe? Absolutely. 
I think that uh, you're tapping into a very important thing, which is what the what's called the um, the mindset of basically the bystander. Bystander, no. So uh, there are lots of experiments in in behavioral science that show that people observe a phenomenon. Now, let's say that there's a bathroom that's leaking water, and basically people can see it. What happens in a group setting is we always assume that someone else is going to take care of it. No, right, so there's right. a lot of studies that show this. So rather than trying to uh, jump into action, take things on our own hand, we think that someone else is going to fix it. And this happens from simpler things, as the example I share, from even more worse uh, scenarios. Let's say you have a leader who's a bully. Well, no one's going to step up because they think someone else is going to do so. Mm. Uh, research shows that three out of four people have experienced uh, issues at work. No, they, for example, things that are not working. Uh, they see something that's about to go wrong. For example, a bad decision or sales results are not going the right direction, but they feel unable to raise a concern with their bosses. No even though the issue was important. So we have this kind of silence problem where people see things that are not good or I might go even worse, but they don't speak up. The uh, thing that drives this is also the fear of retaliation. You know? So if I speak up, am I going to be ignored? Are, are people going to laugh at me? Are people going to criticize me or maybe I'm going to even be punished? You know, like, for example, yeah. I can lose my job, which yeah. is the fear that most people have. Yeah, I think that's a constant thing that goes on in the mind of every, I mean, not every employees, but at least I would say 90% of the employees in every workplace, right? It is, it is. And, yeah. and Amy Edmondson, basically, uh, who coined the term psychological safety, she uncovered basically the, the, the importance, you know, the psychological safety is that a team feels safe for us to take interpersonal risks. That means that I can speak out my mind, I can speak up, I can challenge my boss, I can say whatever and it's going to be all right or share ideas in the open, you no know, when we're brainstorming. Many times we are running a brainstorm and people are not sharing ideas because they are afraid that if they say something that looks off and it's not bright enough, they might be uh, uh, criticized by their bosses or their colleagues. Yeah, also, we'd love to hear about the effects of fear in workplace culture, Gustavo. Well, uh, the moment that people don't participate or keep their ideas to themselves, that affects everyone, right? Yeah. So it affects productivity, it affects collaboration, and it affects also innovation, no? So when we talk about psychological safety, we have like a, what we call the ladder, you no, know, the psychological safety ladder. That basically, it's a continuum. You no, know? so it's not that you have or you don't have psychological safety. It's what's the degree of psychological safety that you have, and the more you have, the higher you can go as a team. So on the lower level, it's about creating belonging. You no, know? so when people feel that they're going to be accepted by the team, that they're going to be welcome as who they are, and they can bring their whole self to work. The next mm -hmm. level, level two, it's cognitive diversity. Basically, I'm encouraged and rewarded, and it's going to be okay if I think differently. And to your point, one of the most important benefits in any team setting, regardless of industry or level, it's that we want people to bring their unique perspectives, their unique viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have psychological safety, then people tend to think mm -hmm. like once, like a you know, group think. Or when the boss or manager speaks up, people are going to uh, repeat or agree with them. And the last level of psychological safety, level three, it's about innovation. So when people feel that they belong to the team, when they feel safe to think differently, then that's where innovation happens. So uh, if you don't have these elements, then the productivity, the engagement, the collaboration and innovation of your team uh, goes down. Mm. Really love the way you explained that, Gustavo. But uh, now let's now discuss its solution. So what are the, uh, what it takes to become a fearless organization? What are the top moves for a leader, you know, to in initiate a fearless uh, culture? Uh, the first thing has to do with uh, understanding that leading is not an easy task or role, 
And most importantly, that leading is not just about one person, but about a, a collective of people. Also in the past, we put too much emphasis on leaders as the human beings or the person playing that role. But today we need to focus more on leadership as a verb, as an action, so leading. And that's something that a fearless culture encourages everyone to lead, not just the most senior executives or the ones who have a formal title. So it's about leading from inside out. It's yeah. about distributing authority so people can make decisions. So that takes a lot of trust that the employees are going to make the, the right calls. It's about pur being purpose-driven. So basically, we all have a shared mission. What's the impact that we want to create? And then we give people freedom and space to make the right decisions to get us there. Hmm. We don't tell them how to get there. Hmm. Hmm. But having said that, Ustavo, there's always a, a need, you know, to uh, draw a line on uh, workplace habits, right? Like being fearless and being fearful in a workplace. Show. So what are the challenges that people face while building a fearless culture and how to deal with them, obviously? Yeah, the challenge, like everything, it, it, it's a transition. And a, when people are used to working in companies where the the roles and and, and, and and responsibilities are much more defined and actually limited, and you give them more freedom and accountability to make decisions, so there's a transition. Mm -hmm. First of all, when you invite people to change and to go in a different direction, people are going to be hesitant. Uh, they want to test the waters before diving in. That means that, uh, uh, is my leader being honest? Are they really going to give us all that freedom and responsibility or they are not? So they're going to test you. They're going to test you as a leader. How committed are you? They're going to push and see if you're really uh, uh, going the direction that you're encouraging your team. Uh, to be honest, not every leader and not every employee, it's great for a fearless culture which requires being more innovative which requires taking more risks which requires okay. to uh, mm -hmm. take more accountability and also operate in a more free uh, setting and that's something that's critical there are some people that thrive in cultures where everything's more defined and structured and they have clear marching orders no? mm -hmm. so uh, if you're moving your organization towards a fearless culture which you should or most companies are it's important to understand what's the right people that you want to uh, bring in. No? Uh, another element about building a fearless culture is when leaders try to transform culture, they tend to focus in, into what's not working, no? what's wrong, what needs to be fixed. Our approach is different. It's about leveraging what's already working. It's using that as a foundation to build a more progressive, uh, modern culture. It's not about starting from scratch if you are a company that's been in business for 10, 20 years, but it's about identifying what are the key things within the company that are working, that are good, and how can we build from there? Right. So it uh, sounds easy, a fearless culture, but I think there are a lot of uh, challenges, right, that leaders face for that. Indeed, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's easier than people think, but it's not easy. <laughs> right. Yeah, so um, coming to uh, the, a very, you know, common thing that is we hear, that we hear uh, today is uh, the hybrid workplace, you know. Uh, people have the choice to come to the workplace and uh, sometimes if they want to work from home or remotely, they can work there. So um, uh, how do you think uh, psychological safety look like in this uh, kind of a format of working? I think it's kind of a, even more critical hmm. because, I mean, a, as I mentioned earlier, it's not that the pandemic made companies a worse. It basically made it more visible, you know, the, the issues that were affecting companies. So many companies were and are really bad at managing meetings. You know, they're very, they have lots of meetings that are uh, ineffective, that are not necessary, that maybe they take too much time uh, and also they're not designed for participation. So they have an agenda, people follow a process, but they're not about to, how can we get into a better outcome and make sure that everyone participates and we can have an interesting kind of a discussion. Mm -hmm. So in order to do that, psychological safety is critical. In a remote or hybrid environment, what happens is two things. First, the people that need to think before they talk and people that are introverted, 
-hmm. they feel uh, left out in conversations because the people that talk too much, they take over all the airspace. Mm -hmm. it, when it comes to distributed teams, what happens is I was the other day facilitating a, an event with a client and the people that were in the room, no matter how much we kept reminding them, hey, there are people in a camera, there are people on the other side, they tend to forget. They tend to speak up. They don't show. They, they are writing on a wall and they forget to, ah, we need to switch the camera. We need to do this. So they, they forget about making sure that people are included. If, I'm not saying that we need to treat the people that are not in the room, in the physical room, like a, a, a differently, but at least we need to make sure that they have certain privileges and they're the first to speak up. They're the first to to being asked how you're doing no? before the people in the room take over. As you may know, research shows that usually there's a preference for those who are in the in the same uh, room, so location bias. And when it comes to promoting people, to give them uh, salary raises or whatever, the people that are physically in the office are uh, in better chances than those that are, are remotely. So in a hybrid workplace, psychological safety is critical to include people, to make sure that we can have these kind of conversations when we're not being fair, when someone feels that they're not being taken into consideration or being excluded, mm -hmm. but also to encourage even, even participation. Right. So inclusion comes to, uh, into a ma major role, right, for this? Absolutely. Yeah, because we want to make sure that everyone has a saying. You know? So, for example, mm -hmm. conversational turn-taking is critical, not give every person their turn to speak, to ask questions, to share feedback, to share ideas. Right. That's important. Making sure that the loudest voices or the most senior people go last. So the introverts and women and people from minority groups can speak first. Hmm. So uh, would you like to give some uh, real life examples of any organization, if you know, that uh, that is doing it very right today? Yeah, I think that... Uh, Atlassian, which is an Australian uh, software company, it's a great organization that regards in how they keep the, the hybrid workplace culture alive. I mentioned this idea of turn taking, that's something that they've been implemented for even before the, the, the pandemic. Not turn taking means that someone's facilitating the meeting mm. and they're asking one person at a time for their contribution. And as I mentioned, uh, they start with women, they start with minorities, they start with the more junior people and leaving the loudest voices uh, uh, last. Uh, GitHub, uh, it's a company that is one of the paradigms of a, a hybrid workplace and basically they are default to um, asynchronous. What this means is in most organizations, we were taught to work synchronously. So we're used to people being in the same place at the same time working together. Mm. So that's a, big, that's a big shift. When it comes to collaboration in a hybrid workplace, most of the collaboration doesn't happen in the same place. And for sure, it doesn't happen at the same time. It happens asynchronously. Mm. So basically, we're allowing teams team members to choose when they want to reply, you know? So uh, uh, instead of expecting people to answer to my Slack message or to my email instantly, we know that they need time for, for them to do deep work and they're going to get back to us whenever they have a chance. So there's a lot of trust in that regards that's critical. Mm. Another thing that GitHub does, which is critical, is um, documentation. You know? mm. So instead of having people going and ask all the team members, where's that file? What's the last decision that we made regarding whatever? There's a lot of very heavy, very detailed documentation about everything that the team does and defines and decides. So any team member can get into those documents at any time and see what's going on. What are the last latest agreements? How do we do things? What are our processes? What are the progress in different projects without having to talk to people, which makes a lot of uh, things more uh, efficient, so to speak, as well. Yeah. But also it allows to participation because those documents that capture how we work and the work that we're doing, it's built by everyone's uh, participation. Okay, so finally, Gustavo, is there any suggestion that you'd love to give to our HR listeners today? I think that... Uh, the most important thing about anything that has to do with culture, it has to do with being uh, genuine, 
so many companies try to copy what other companies are doing, and that's a problem. You know, like the, everyone wants to be like Google or Atlassian or Apple or whatever company or Amazon you choose, and basically they lose relevancy. You know, so first because they try to be someone who they are not, and also because they usually try to tell a story that's going to be looking good for recruiting new people. But then when people get hired and they start working in the company, then they feel, look, this is not the company I sign up for. No? So there's a, a gap. So my first thing is be authentic, be who you are. Don't try to fool people and don't try to fool yourself. Mm. Another thing that's important when talking about culture, uh, usually a leader specifically, most senior confuse the culture they want to build, the ideal culture, with your current culture. And that's a huge mistake. It's good to have, okay, this is the type of culture you want to build, but it's also important to understand where are you today, you know, because that's going to help you assess the different elements that are, not, uh, that are not working and then build a path towards improving your culture rather than starting from an unrealistic point. Right. Thank you so much for all the insights, Gustavo. Um, would love to know how our listeners can reach out to you if they want to. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I mean, you can look at me uh, at LinkedIn, Gustavo Rassetti. Uh, I mean, there are many, but not at Fearless Culture, so you're going to be able to find that. Uh, you can go to our website, which is www.fearlessculture.design. And my email is gustavo at fearlessculture.design. And, and, and you can reach out to me at any time if you're looking if you're looking for information, tips, advice, or want to see how we can help your team or organization. That would be fantastic. Those are the main places where you can find me. And we also have a blog within our website that has over 600 articles on culture, leadership, team building with lots of free tools as well. So if you want to sign up there, Okay. You're going to be able to get all the latest content and also download lots of tools on psychological safety and hybrid teams and more. Brilliant. I really hope it will be very helpful to all our listeners and I'll also go through the website. Okay. So that was a very nice to connect with you, Gustavo. And thanks a lot for joining me in the Vantage HR Influencers podcast. No, absolutely. It's been a pleasure and any time and I hope you're a audience find this conversation useful and thank you for the invitation it was an honor uh, let's stay in touch take care thanks for listening to the vantage hr influencers podcast please do subscribe to vantage hr influencers podcast on apple podcast spotify and our youtube channel for new episodes